It says there, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Who was the voice? The word, Jesus. Think carefully, he was in the word. He was the word. He came from the bosom of the Father. He was speaking to them because he had a right to have fellowship with them because they were in the garden where they were destined, where you and I were destined to live, trouble-free, a life of peace and goodness and mercy. That's what it was. But the minute they ate of that fruit, there was an exchange of that good life. And we took on that sinful life. That was then in the Garden of Eden. And the word then was only the word. He was the word. Trying to get through to them. But the minute their eyes had opened to the sinful nature, no longer could he speak to them and them hear and understand. So they hid from him. In the book of John and chapter 19, it says here, it's not chapter 19. Verse 28, 19, verse 28. Okay? So you remember I said you had an exchange? Adam gave away our Zoe life. He gave it away. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He had to come so that he could die for you and me. So that we could get back the Zoe life. We could go back to living like in the Garden of Eden. Verse 28 says, After the, this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said in fulfillment of the scripture, I thirst. A vessel of sour wine was placed there, so they put a sponge soaked in the sour wine on a stalk lid of his up and held it to his lips. When Jesus had received the, uh, the sour wine, he said, It is is finished. What was finished? The exchange. I'm going to read it to you in another verse, in another uh, translation. It says here, in verse 28, later knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Verse 30 says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. What is he saying? All that I came to do is done. So, you know we're going to say, oh Jesus. No, he's transferred the baton into your hand. The answer is now in you. Jesus in you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. It is finished. Adam gave the divine exchange the life of God, into the hand of the enemy. He gave up that life. The word could not affect his life anymore. Until faith, Jesus died on the cross. When he died, he said, it is finished. On the third day, which is the Sunday, he rose again. The stone was rolled away. All the grave cloths were lying on the floor. Because, but you know when it happened? When he said, it is finished. When he rose again, what happened was, the Zoe life came back into your and my hand. That is what happened. So you no longer have an excuse for living in defeat. Because you and I have got back what Adam had given away. Because Jesus came and he gave it back into your and my hand. We are the divine carriers of the divine life of God. Oh no, you're looking too religious this morning. Oh, do you understand who you are this morning? You are carriers of the most high God. Jesus said, I go unto the Father. But you are here on the earth. He says you are in the world, but you're not of the world. You're not of the world because you are the divine carriers of the presence of God. He says, whatsoever man believeth, so shall he have. Isn't it? 
So who is he talking about? Because of him? He already gave it into your hand. The reason you don't have is not because Jesus didn't give. It's because you forgot three times two is six. Think. Let's go again. You don't have because you don't know. You haven't begun to perceive. You haven't begun to understand. You forgot the knowledge you have of who is in you. When you understand who is in you, then you start to change. You no longer cower and think, oh, who are? No, you stand up straight. And you begin to understand, I'm no longer a natural man. I'm no longer a carnal man. I am a spirit man. I no longer have the old life of defeatist thinking. I don't have the old life where I was somebody who nobody knew. No, now I am who God says I am. I'm the son of the most high God. In my mouth is the power to change and effect changes in a very atmosphere. Come, three times two is, who are you? Son of the most high God, hallelujah. That's how easy it must be. I'm trying to draw a parallel to you. You know your times table, you know natural things. Let's switch over now. Let's switch over. As well as you know the timetables and the, and the rands and the dollars, start to understand who you are. Because when circumstances then face you, you will turn around and say, you stop right there. Because do you know who I am? You actually don't have a right to dominate me. I have a right to dominate you. Let's go back again. Why am I telling you this? You need to understand as natural as you understand the natural things of life. You need to understand the spirit things of life. You need to understand that I'm here just for an experience of a worldly experience. But I haven't come here to just be ordinary. I was ordinary. But the day I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, Jesus came into my heart. The Holy Ghost came in me. I became the tabernacle of the Most High God. I have the power to effect changes. You need to understand and know that. Let me tell you why I said to you the word no. Let me ex tell you what the word no or understand means. So you'll understand why I'm, I'm majoring on that word. The word understand is a verb, right? To my English scholars. Know what some, it knows what something means or how it works. Or why it exists. So you need to understand the God life. The Zoe life. You need to understand that that life exists in you. You are not ordinary. Not one of you. Not even a little child like that. Not ordinary. The minute the word of God comes into you. And you start to understand that word. You automatically become different. The minute you accept Jesus Christ as personal savior. That was the key, the key that unlocked the door to a life that is eternal. But understanding is a noun. Now look at what that word means, the power to understand. Now Jesus says, all power has been given unto you in heaven and in earth. All power. Isn't it strange that that word would say the power to understand? So you have no need not to understand. You need to understand that word. You need to understand who you are. And I'm going to keep going on. And I don't care whether you yawn or whether you go to sleep on me. But if that's all you hear from me today, as easy as the timetable is to you, I want you to know I'm not a normal person. I am a supernatural being. I am a spirit man. I have the word of God in me. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. He says in uh, the first epistle of John chapter 4, he says, you hail from God. Why do you hail from God? Because Christ in you, the hope of glory. He doesn't stop there. He says, you hail from God. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Starting to get it is the divine exchange. It's already there. 
You know you have a heart, right? You know what your heart does. But do you ever consider your heart? Do you ever think, oh, I wonder if it's working today? It just naturally happens. Now I want you to think about your spirit life just like that. As you meditate upon the word of God, it must be so natural that you must know something's going to happen even before it's going to happen. You must know somebody's, somebody, somebody's trying to attack your child because inside of you, the spirit of God is saying, pray for so and so. You immediately know that is what you call to. That is what you call to, that divine life. That was just the pudding. Or let's put it this way, a starter. Do you know what the word I have for you this morning really is? But if you don't understand what I exchanged with you just now, you cannot receive what I'm going to say to you now. The word I have for you this morning is, receive the word of the prophet and run with it. But let me tell you, as you get to know who you are, and that the fact that you are a spirit man, when you hear a spirit man speaking, you'll automatically obey. Because you know why? You know that what he's saying is in line with what's on the inside of you. Amen. Then it won't be hard. It won't be hard. When Jesus speaks, the disciples listened and obeyed. The results were astounding. You're going to say to me, but what do you mean? Okay. G uh, Peter and his brother Andrew were fishermen. They were businessmen. They were making money. When Jesus met them, what did he say? He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Did they follow? Don't you think it was if there wasn't a connection and they didn't follow, what would have happened? They would have stayed where they were. You and I, busy with our lives. And what happened? We heard the call to give our hearts to Jesus and to become changed and to become fishers of men. There has to be a point in your life where you make a decision. Even though you're saved, a lot of you have just stayed saved. I'm happy, I'm a Christian. No, that's not what we call to. We call to a divine walk where the manual for this walk is the word. And when you start to read the word, the word starts to activate the life that is already on the inside of you. When Peter and, Peter and his brother Andrew started to follow Jesus, I'll read you what the Holy Spirit says here. He says, they were just fishermen, but once they, they left their nets, they became, right? They became. Once... You were lost. Now you've become saved. God has made you into another man by the Spirit of God that dwells on the inside of you. Okay? Obeying causes you to become from fisherman to disciple. Obeying causes you to become from a failure to a success. Then Jesus called James and John. They were also... People who are fishermen, they were working with their dad. Actually, they were mending nets. But they walked away from that because the call had come. The call for a change of a mindset had come. A call to a change of a lifestyle had come. Their father could not have been happy because he didn't understand. He wasn't called. They were called. How many of us? We still feel the tug of family ties. Even though their mindsets are old, we've been called into the new, but we're struggling between the two, from the old into the new. Brethren, what I'm talking to you about this morning is a change of a lifestyle. From the old to the new. Because in the new, you have divine healing, prosperity, success. You can never be disadvantaged. All things that pertain unto life and godliness are yours. They're in your hands. What did Jesus do throughout his walk in Jerusalem? Do you know what happened? Every time he went to heal somebody. Do you remember the man with the withered hand? It was a Sunday. So all religious folk were sitting there. And they were watching him. 
to see whether he was going to heal the man or not. They never considered the man and the fact that that man could actually be healed. No. The religious idea was this. It's a Sunday. It's a Sabbath. And you're not allowed to do that. Now, how many of us live like that? We live conditioned to this world. Because if the world says you stay there and that's how you are, then you just accept it. No. It's time for a change. Don't think about the Sabbath. Think about the man that needs to be free. Think about the person that needs freedom. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a religious mindset that needs to be broken off our lives. We need to live in this fullness of life. You know what we do even as parents? Sometimes we keep our children in bondage because we haven't moved. They mustn't move. But they're ready for this divine life. I was saying to Tesla yesterday, I said, you have the opportunity at 11 years old to hear the word that will penetrate your life, that you'll never make the mistakes we made because of religious doctrine that was forced down our throats. No, when she hears the word, it won't take Tesla two minutes to obey. You know why? That's all she knows. There's no religious mindset that's blocking her from receiving. Now, are you starting to understand what I'm saying to you? As easy as it is for a child to receive, so must it be with us that when we hear the word and when you read the word of God, it must just say, wow, that's mine. That is mine. Somebody who's been suffering with sugar diabetes for like 10 years and you've been taking all of the stuff and suddenly I say to you, it's just a mirage. You'll say to me, no, you're talking nonsense. But let me tell you something. When you take the word and you start to get the word in you and, the words, and you start to hear the word that says, by his stripes, I am healed. And the word starts to say that you are quickened in your mortal body by the power that worketh in you. According to Ephesians chapter 3 and 20, he says, God can do all things above all that you can think or ever imagine. And when you start to meditate upon that word, and you start to wrestle with that word, and that word starts to take a hold of you, even though you've had that symptom for 10 years, it starts to lift because the word starts to activate it out of your body. And it starts, you start to realize, oh, I don't have to accept this anymore. No longer do I have to be contaminated by this. Oh, no. I don't have to have it. And those of you that have been in financial debt for so long, you've become accustomed to it. But when you start to take the word and the word starts to say, bring your tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now there with that there may be, that I will not open up the windows of heaven. Then he says, Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Then he says in Ephesians, he says that put on the whole armor of God. He says, you do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Oh, man, that financial bondage starts to take on just a name. Because then you start to hear, God has given him a name that is above every other name. Oh, and then you start to think, oh, financial burden, you're just a name. And at the name of Jesus, you must depart. Because as I put my seed into the offering, it is a seed planted. And that word will activate and start to bring deliverance to me. And financial burden, you must go in the name of Jesus. Am I starting to touch someone's heart? Am I starting to touch someone's mindset here this morning? Oh, no, don't be like the religious scribes and Pharisees. Oh, my mother was poor and my father was poor and that's where I'm staying. No, I want to start to see you guys as billionaires. Not just millionaires. Let's move on. I mean, you, some of the houses I've seen, it's about 6.5 million. So what's 1 million? I, 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 we move on. And not because we want money, but because we need money. To advance the kingdom, we gotta stop getting, we, we gotta get out of our little comfort zones. That comfort zone has gotta change now. Me, my husband, and my two children. No, there's other people out there that need you. My headache, my sickness, no, the devil likes you there. He likes you there because he boxes you in and he can contain you. 
No, you can't be contained. You can't be contained. It's not for you to be contained. How can you contain God? He's the creator of the universe. He lives on the inside of you. And if he lives on the inside of you, how can you be contained? You cannot be contained. The word of God in you is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder to the bone and the marrow and to the intents of the heart. That's what I'm talking about. I don't want you to become obsessed with just prosperity. But it's just part of the package. What can I say? It's part of the package. It's part of the... It, you know what they say? When, when you're in management and they say, oh, somebody's coming against it, it's part for the cause. Ha. <laughs> hey. To live this victorious life, it's part of the cause. Amen. This victorious life is par for the cause. Too many people say we're stuck on being rich. No. A king is not poor. So why you want us to be poor? A king is not sick. When he's sick, he goes and he calls a prophet and the priest and he wants to get well because he understands that he's not supposed to be there. So why do we want to be there? And we're quite content with our little shop on the corner. No, it's time to extend that. Time to extend that. And for those of you that are those people that see, oh, the cup is only half full. No, look at it as an opportunity to fill it to the top. Please, as a child of God, you are not a complainer. You are part of the solution. You know why? The solution's on the inside of you. When your neighbor is sick, it's not your neighbor's problem. It's your problem. Because you're sitting with the answer, but you're containing it in your house. Walk over this. Shake your shoulders. Take this word, which is quick and powerful, and say to him or to her, like that child did when he laid hands on, on that lady. He said to her, take it. He didn't know what he was doing, but he received the word of the prophet. He received the word of the prophet, and he said to that lady, take it. You do the same. Start to change your mindset and think like a child would when they receive the word of God. It will quicken you and take you to your next level. What's holding you in the level you're at is the way the world has conditioned your mind. And you need to break out. And the only way you will ever break out to the way the world has made you think is by taking the word of God. When you meditate therein, day and night, he said to Joshua, take the word of God, and meditate therein day and night. But I want to go further than that. It's good to have the word in your heart, but it can't stay there. No. You've got to learn to start talking. Imagine when the, in the beginning of the uh, Bible, in the book of Genesis, it says that and God looked at the earth and was without void, without form, but what did God have to do? The Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters. He was hovering over the waters, ready for action. And how was he able to go into action? When, the, when God said, when God said, let there be, the Holy Ghost went and he activated. Do you know what? The angels are all around you. They are ministering angels to the ears of salvation. He's waiting for you to activate the word. He's waiting for you to say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I am the righteousness of God. Greater. If God be for me, who can be against me? Sickness and disease, go. He's waiting for those words to come out of your mouth. You've got to keep talking. doesn't matter what happens. You've got to keep talking. You see, that word that was talking to Adam in the book of Genesis is the same word that's in you. Now, if that same word was able to change things, how much more can you change things? Because the word is in you. But the problem is, the carriers of the word are being contained. They're packaged, and they're on the shelf. They prepare to live normal lives. It's like in an artillery storeroom. There's many, many weapons in there. They're useless on the shelf. They just stock in the storeroom, right? Agree with me? But take that artillery and put it into the machine it was designed to shoot with 
And what will happen? What will happen? It will do the job it was intended to do. The same thing. The word in you is just shelved. Until you speak it, it can never change anything. But when you start to speak it, it starts to change the atmosphere. When your child starts to cheek you and says things, you say to him, you are a blessing. You are the anointed of the Lord. You are saved. You will never go astray. You say to him, but he is. Well, he will be for as long as you see him like that. But for as long as you start saying, you are a blessing. You are empowered to prosper. He look at you like you're nuts. But very soon, the word that you have activated into the atmosphere will connect with his spirit. And he will be transformed and changed. Not because he wanted to, but because you activated the word on his life. It's about time you started to get out of the storeroom. And start to activate and make changes where you are. Too many believers out there in the world go to church every Sunday and they mark themselves present. I went to church. Which church you go to? I go to so-and-so and I go to so-and-so. Oh, that's nice. And then they start having a conversation about, oh, you know what happened this weekend? And there we go. The believers are part of that conversation like nothing happened. What's the difference? What's the difference? That's why we're not even changing Durban. We're not changing our families. You know why? We talk like they do, so they're thinking, so that's fine. We can just be like you. No. You need to start taking the bull by the horns. And you need to start saying, when they start talking about death and uh, unbelief, and people, you say, no, no, I'm so sorry. I used to live like that. But do you know what the word says? And they say, oh, no, but, and you know, especially the families, they like to tell you, oh, well, um, your father had uh, uh, heart trouble, so you're going to have, uh, you say, no. I refuse to accept that. Because let me tell you, I don't know about you and what you're going to accept, but this package over here, I'm not accepting. It was never addressed to me. It was never intended for me. I'm not the recipient. I will not have heart trouble. I will not have whatever those diseases that came down the line. Because the minute I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior, the buck stopped there. I took on a new bloodline. For those of you that are sitting here, you probably think, oh, you know, you and pastor always telling us to say these things. But if you don't say them, how can you change? How can you change? You need to understand. You need to perceive. You need to know the supernatural like you do the natural. When you went to school, you didn't argue with your teacher. You just learned all those things. Half the things you learned never even helped you. Probably geography because you need to read a map. History. You need to know history. I want to teach you prophecy. You need to prophesy. History is good, but it's a platform on which to go from there to here. No longer history. I'm a history maker. I refuse to stay there. What happened to you is good, but I want more. I'm going higher. I'm going forward. I cannot accept what used to be. It's not good enough for me. Why should it be good enough for you? No, there's more that God has for you. Do you know there's some people here that could be budding presidents coming forward? But you know what? You think so little of yourself that everyone walks past you. How many times you see somebody doing something, you think, oh, you know, I can do that. But guess what? The only reason they went is they are doing it is because they took the bold step of faith and went to do it. How many of you are preachers in the house? Many more of you are more eloquent than me. It's just I was bold enough to step out and do what God called me to do. See, I have a loud mouth and a loud voice. 
But God decided, well, seeing that you put yourself in my hand, I'm going to use it. Now, there's some very articulate people in the crowd. There are some very, very good people that are highly qualified in this crowd. You know how to carry yourself. You probably have better manners than I do. But you know what? Until you unleash the, the sophistication that surrounds you, God can't use you. For as long as you are bound up in the things that the world has taught you, God can't use you. You know why he used Paul? Paul was a radical man. God is looking for radical people. He's looking for people that will go from mediocre to the supernatural ability of God. He's looking for people who are hungry. He's looking for people that want more. The minute, the minute you start thinking like that, oh man, there is no limit to what God can do for you. How many of you, when you buy, how religious are we when we buy a house because we've been taught we have to dedicate it to the Lord? Do you know that the mere fact that you laid your hands on it, it's already, it's blessed. It's blessed. But because we have these mindsets of old religion and tradition, and it's good, but you know what? If you went to your man of God before you bought whatever you bought, and he said to you, yes, go ahead, the word from the prophet's mouth already anointed what you bought. You don't believe me? You don't believe me? You don't know how powerful a word in a prophet's mouth is. When he tells you something, just do it. Do you remember the wedding of Cana of Galilee? They went there and the, there was no wine. And Jesus' mother said to him, there's no wine. And he said to her, well, what, what has that got to do with me? That didn't bother her. All she said is, whatever he tells you to do, do it. How many of you know, probably in the house, there were times when there was something that was missing or something that was short. And all he did was say the word. So she used that history to prophesy. And she said to them, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. I'm saying to you this morning, whatever the word tells you to do, just do it. And when you do it, you will activate results in your life that you never ever expected. I'm mean, going to go with me to Mark 1, verse 37. I, I never get to share with you the things that I really want to share with you. But one thing I do want, before you leave here, I need you to have a mindset change. But that can only be by the dunamis power of God, the word that is activated that you receive. And unless you receive it, there will be no change. Mark 1 verse 37 says, And the disciples let him know that the people were looking for him. But what was Jesus' word to them? However, he said to them, Let us be going on into the neighboring town, that we may preach there also, for that was why they, they came. Then he, this is how the word says to me, There was no argument from the disciples. They followed what he said. There's only one way that you can follow what the Word says, is when you start to know the Word like you know your timetables. When you start to know the Word like you know every natural thing in your life, that is when you start to activate and receive the Word. You need to learn how to receive, but you can only receive when you understand. You need to, that word understanding the power to understand. That power has been given unto you to understand the word of God and to change your circumstance. Your man of God has got a word for you for your season. Even though you are enjoying the season you are in, when the word is given unto you, do what you're told. Citizens of Zion know how to do this because they know the voice of their shepherd and obey the command of the shepherd's this determines whether they will go forward or whether they will go backward. What determines that? Listening and obeying the voice of the shepherd. 
Unlike the ways of the world where you feel empowered and you want to do what you want, in the city of Zion you experience complete liberty. Yet, when you hand over your will to the voice of the shepherd, and in this way you are transported to a higher level of freedom. That's a paradox. You have the freedom in the city of Zion, but what you do is you yield to the voice of the shepherd. The high shepherd speaks to the shepherd of the house who then speaks to you. And as you yield to that voice, even though it feels as if you're giving over your freedom, you actually go to a higher level of freedom. Jesus knew exactly how to do this. The will of the Father was his will, and he did it willingly. You have the greatest example of all. Jesus said, I only do the things that the Father tells me to do. Yet, when he was on earth, he had free reign. Do you remember? He was the word in the bosom of the Father. So when he came here, he had free reign. Yet he gave up that liberty to do what the Father says. And that's what you and I need to do. We need to shake off that selfish way of thinking that if I listen, oh, what about me and what I think? No. If you do what the Word says you should do, automatically you get more than you ever anticipated, and more than you ever dreamed or imagined. In Mark 2, this is a marvelous one. This is, do you remember he was sitting in the house of Peter? Mark chapter 2. He was sitting in the house of Peter, and the, there was so much of a crowd that they could not come into the house. What did they do? They made a hole in the roof. Oh, my word. When I wrote this down, I thought, I'm going to really laugh when I tell you this one. Imagine your fancy house that you have, and it's so full. And somebody needs healing, and they break your roof. What will you do? You're going to be very, very upset, aren't you? No. Peter was so sold out to Jesus that despite the fact that they broke into the roof, all Peter thought about was there was a man that was healed. And that's what we need to focus on. Not so much on us and ourselves, but what people around us need. We are fishers of men. God blesses you to bless others. Not for you to keep going into the jewelry store and buy yourself five watches. No. You need to go and bless others. The money has been given to you so that you can advance the kingdom of God. I want to tell you something. As you give it away, it comes back in multiplication. So I'm not telling you because, oh, I'm not. No, I give. I, I, whenever I leave on a Sunday, I have to go and draw money because everything that's in my purse, I take it out. I, I just give it. And I've been like that for years. It's not something I've started now. I remember even as being a, a Muslim, that was something that was natural to me. I would give. You know why they have a lot? And, you all, and yes, some of them are thieves and whatever and whatever. But... There's a principle they operate in that, that is a principle of the kingdom. The principle of the kingdom is to sow, to, as you sow, you will reap. They've tapped into that principle because they sow. They sow. So when I came into the kingdom, it wasn't hard for me to sow. But because I was a priest's daughter, one of the things that God calls me to do, I always blessed my man of God. Always, not now it's my husband, but then it was every pastor that we fellowshiped with. It wasn't hard for us to bless him. Because even though I was a priest's daughter, we lived very well. We were fairly wealthy. I was never in lack. Now, if the men in the heathen religions can live good lives, what's wrong with you and I? Why can't we live good lives? Why should only the heathen be rich? It's not par for the course for them. It's divine exchange for you. It came with the package for you. It should be an accepted norm for you. I've lost some of you. you... Okay, you need to perceive and understand and obey. This will result not only in you being healed, but also to those around you being healed. 
But you know what? Even in the house, think about this here. I'm going to tell you something about a mindset. When they were sitting in the house of Peter, Peter didn't mind his house, the roof being broken. But sitting in that house was old religious folk. What were they wondering? Is he going to heal them on the Sabbath? Are they going to do this? How many of us, we ask God for something, and we wonder, are you going to answer? No, you don't have to wonder. He's in you. When you speak the word, it's already answered. Oh, please move away from this. Dear Jesus, please will you give me money? No, he's not going to give you money. He doesn't give you money. He says, men shall give into your bosom, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now you show me in the word where it says Jesus said he'll give you money. Where did he say he'll give you bread? But he did say, so. He did. And your seed will bring you a harvest. So the key is already in your hand. But you say, but I don't have. No, even if you don't have and somebody blesses you with 10 rand, take a rand and sow it. Don't hold on to it and hoard it. No. You know why? Because you're even eating your seed. Do you know a farmer when he harvests? They keep seed aside for the next season. They don't eat everything. But you know why a poor man stays poor? Because all that they have, they take and they eat. No. You need to take some of it away. You see, the poor don't need money. They need the gospel preached to them. Because the gospel will set you free. It's good news. To you and me, we have good news. We do not have to accept what the normal man accepts. Healing is our portion. I'm going to read something. I'm going to, I think I'll come to a close. Our human nature has been replaced by the nature of God. And these are the things that you will say. We cannot sin. We cannot fail. We are overcomers. We are more than conquerors. We are a success. We have the life of God in us. We have the supernatural ability of God in us. The old way of thinking is replaced by the mind of Christ. Oh, man. You know what? There's so much I want to tell you. But when I'm looking at some of you, you're not drawing it out of me, so you're not getting too much of it. I'm looking at some of you, and you're like, you know what? I sit there and I draw out of pastor because I know how much he has on the inside of him. And this morning, if you know what I have on the inside of me, and if you just draw a little bit more, you will get so much more out. Because I know what the Holy Ghost has said. I know what he said. He says it's yours. All things are yours. All things are yours this morning. You don't have to be sick. You don't have to be living doubt and unbelief. He's not given you a spirit of fear, but he's given you a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. He says that you are success. You do not have to be disadvantaged. You are a winner, not a loser. You're from above, not beneath. You're the head, you're not the tail. You need to arise. You need to call forth those things that be not as though they were. Faith worketh in you. He says, seeing those things that be not as though they were. Calling those things in this morning, they're yours. He says, even as he was, so are we in this world. Even as he prophesied, so we say this morning. Hallelujah. We need to arise and become the men and women God has called us to be. Hallelujah. We cannot just sit there because when we sit there, we're accepting what the enemy has said. But we need to arise and we say to this body, arise, be healed in the name of Jesus. Arise and shake off. I do not need oppression and depression because the Spirit of God is quickening me. I have the life of God in me. Oh, Jesus in me, the hope of glory. I'm a king. I'm a child of the Most High God. I am not defeated. I am not dead. I cannot die soon. No, because Jesus said, with long life have I satisfied you. You can't say I cannot sleep, so I need to take a tablet. He said, sweet sleep I give to my beloved. Hallelujah. 
those are the things that are in me that you need to draw out so that it become part of you and part of your nature because you have the nature of Christ in you. Oh, you don't have because you don't ask. You don't have because when you ask, you ask amiss. I want to tell you, we are so focused on sin. No, we don't need a sin consciousness. We need a God consciousness. Do you know what sin is? Sin is when you have fear, doubt, and unbelief. That's all. So if you're sick and fear is starting to come upon you, you immediately understand you don't belong in this body. You spirit of fear, I cast you out in Jesus' name. You spirit of healing begin to arise in my body because body, you will align yourself to the word of God. You will quicken yourself to the word of God. I am changed. I am renewed. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, no matter what sickness or disease you have, don't bow to it. You know, if you have a headache and you keep taking tablets, it'll come back again. You know why? You bowed to it the first time. You've got to stop doing that. You've got to understand who you are in Christ. And when they give you a message about your child being sick or having asthma, you look at that child and you say to that child, believe me, the child understands. You look at the child and you say to the child, asthma does not live in you. You know why sometimes the child is a baby? Who receives the sickness? The parent. Because the parent says, the doctor tells who doesn't tell the child. Tells the child? No. Tells the parent. Tells the parent, you know what? That child has asthma. So the parent starts to take the thought. The thought becomes a stronghold. And as it becomes a stronghold, it takes a hold of the child. So now the, the parent has made something to bow to. It's bound to the asthma in the child. Every time the child gets sick, won't take the child. What happened? You're bowing to the asthma. Guess what? The child then bows to the altar of asthma. You're starting to get the drift of what I'm saying to you. So where should the buck stop? With the parent. When the doctor says to you, your child has asthma, you walk out in the name of Jesus. Asthma, you don't belong in this child. You look at your baby and you let the word go to your baby and you remind your baby that Jesus lives on the inside of you. You will never be sick. Not a day in your life will you be sick. And you know what happens? Even the baby starts to arise. By the time the baby is an adult, they know who they are. But for as long as we have the mindset that sickness is okay, we create altars in our homes. I want to open some cupboards in some of your homes. A mini chemist, isn't it? You know why? It's so normal. We are conditioned to this world, to the normality of this world. It's time to move on. It's time to take those things out and throw them away. And say, you know what? I'm done with you. I used to have this altar. So you see, it's not all those pictures of the altars I'm teaching you now, is it? No. It's the altars of those things we accept in our homes that become norm. It's the altars of the movies we watch and the things we accept as norm. And then we wonder why our children dress a particular way or speak a certain way. Many of the American movies, the children backchat their parents. And we're wondering why our children are so rebellious. Well, we introduced the spirit of rebellion through the TV. We created an altar. It's about time we took our place as men and women of our households. And we said to that child, I love you. But you know what the word of God says? I'm not saying it. The word of God says, children, obey your parents so that you may have a long life. So I don't know about you, child, whether you like a short life or a long life. But I prefer a long life with you. So let's choose the word. Amen. 
I look around the church. I was watching a lot of TV uh, uh, and gospel. I'm talking about watching uh, uh, gospel channels. And I see some, the way the women dress. I am amazed. I, the spirit of lust reigns. It reigns because we've allowed it in. Now we're talking home talk. Men are finding it hard to stay faithful to their wives. Why? Because we're not dealing with the spirit of lust. Women are finding it hard to stay faithful to their husbands. Why? We are allowing the spirit of lust to come in. We need to break it. We need to take authority over it. You know how many Christians I hear that swear the bank language, FBCs and Ds? Why? There's a better language. It's sweeter than any words you've ever heard. It's about time that the God life started to come to the top. I'm not condemning you. What I'm saying to you, you've accepted an old life. Remove it today. Reprogram yourself. Reprogram the success in you. Remind your body you're an overcomer. You don't have to talk like any person talks. Adrian and Musa were talking the other day, and I said to Adrian, kings don't talk like that. He wasn't swearing. He was just talking some, I don't know what they were saying. You know, normal guy talk. But even that's not acceptable. You talk like a king. You carry yourself like a king. You don't joke like the world jokes. And how dare you enjoy rude jokes? That is beneath you. Ooh, it's too low. It's a low life. You're from the high life. It's too low for you. When they share jokes like that, you say, I heard that before, done that, got the t-shirt, moving on. That's what you need to say. You're a king. You're a priest. You are a man and woman of God. How dare you accept a low life? That's down there. You are up here. You don't need anything that the world can give you. What they're giving you is second hand. It's like, you know, like they say Nike and then in Japan, or where is it that make the fakes? Why accept fake when you can get the real thing? Hey, you got, you have been made for bigger things. You've been made for the higher life. And why do you always look at, oh, I don't think I can buy this because I don't have enough money. It's about time you see yourself shopping and buying the best because you are the best. You are only with a little because you've only seen yourself with a little. You're driving a jalopy because maybe it's time to sow that jalopy to somebody else. Won't be long. You may take a bus for one or two days. But the mere fact that you sowed it, somebody else will sow into your own life. But if you don't dig the ditch, it can never be filled for too long. The world has said, keep as much as you can. The Bible says, the more you give, the more shall be given unto you. Isn't that a, a big difference? The, the, Bible, the Bible says, love those that persecute you. The world says, 